uh, what protocols is there for manual therapy uh, for pre and post operative management at the first and then we want to uh, talk about other uh, issues okay so manual therapy in relation to pre and post operative well is this your answer there isn't as far as i'm aware this hasn't specifically been looked at um, and in fact in my recent study in February this year, when I was looking at the Delphi study, um, I was asking people specifically about what components should be in a best practice pre and post operative voice therapy intervention and asked specifically, should manual therapy be a essential part of it? And there was no agreement that it should be an essential part of the intervention. However, the expert speech and language therapy panel said that they felt it should be an additional um, component for patients who had additional muscle tension problems alongside their, um, their lesion. So, so there's no evidence, as far as I'm aware, that's looked at it specifically in this client group, um, pre and post operative, but and there's a feeling amongst expert clinicians that it's probably an additional tool, but not an essential tool. Okay. What about uh, MTD or uh, some problems like uh, vocal fold paralysis and paralysis and working with the professional voice users? What are the evidence? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's lots of evidence out there. I think one of the problems that we have when we talk about manual therapy is it can mean so many different things. Um, it can mean the kind of Jacob Lieberman style laryngeal manipulation, which I was trained in, which is very targeting specific muscles. It can be more of the Walt Fritz type of um, massage manual therapy it can be nelson roy has done um, a lot of work so there's different ways of doing this different levels of patient involvement in doing their own manual therapy and it can mean a huge range of things to different people depending on who you you speak with but there's a lot of evidence out there and i would look probably at those three people lieberman uh, walt fritz and nelson roy there will be many others uh, to find out more about um, manual therapy and, as you say, muscle tension dysphonia, even muscle tension dysphagia. Uh, so we're not talking about that today, but the swallowing side of things. Again, it's coming in uh, manual therapy after head and neck cancer. It's that I think it's going to be a you know it's a big area being used in lots of different uh, conditions. Do you have dry uh, dry needle link? for your practice. One of our colleagues asked me about uh, physiotherapists' uh, involvement in treating uh, muscle tension dysphonia. Uh, I heard uh, recently about that. Is that true? Uh, is there such a thing you have? Did you dry needle ink, did you say? Yes. Not something I've ever heard of, I'm afraid. I don't know. <laughs> you don't? Uh, physiotherapists, uh, is, uh, are there have a rule for a role for uh, treating patients with MTD? Um, yes, I think that you know, like osteopaths or physios, speech therapists, vocal coaches, there's a role for all of us. Uh, there's room for all of us if somebody is appropriately trained, and I think that's the key thing. You need to understand the area, the muscles, the physiology, anatomy of what you're dealing with. Uh, are there any uh, direct relation between a a psychological issues such as stress and uh, anxiety in developing a lesion? Because most of people who have these problems uh, also have uh, psychological issues and uh, they think they can't be uh, treated because of uh, those things. What is uh, your opinion about this? Um, well, to the best of my knowledge, there's no evidence suggesting that, um, that stress and anxiety 
has a direct cause to it. However, there's no evidence to suggest that. However, if you think more broadly, you can see that there's definitely a relationship because if you think about some of the behaviours of somebody who may be stressed and anxious, we know that there are, um, in terms of muscle tension, which could then lead on to lesion development. We know that somebody who has high levels of stress may have more reflux problems. And as a consequence of that, maybe coughing more. So that could absolutely lead to more phonotrauma. So we know that they're definitely related. And we also know that patients with um, patients who have a voice disorder do have increased levels of depression, anxiety, and um, social isolation. And that is highest in those with benign vocal fold lesions. Whether that's the cause of it or whether that's a consequence of it, you know, these are issues that need to be untangled. But I would never say that it should prevent anyone from having treatment because of their stress or anxiety. You deal with that as well. Um, you know, most patients have a whole range of things going on, whether it's physical health problems or mental health problems. It should never prevent anyone from accessing treatment. We've just got to manage the different factors that are causing the problem.